Happy Monday, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I am your host, of course, James Murphy, and I appreciate you for downloading, listening, and enjoying today's episode. As always, if you're new, welcome to the show. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the Home Run Derby, and after that, it's all Red Sox, because that's kind of literally all what we have at this point, right? I'm going to talk about the Red Sox first-round draft pick, uh, Marcelo Meyer, and then I'm also going to react and kind of reflect on the first half of the 2021 season for the Boston Red Sox. And then lastly, this is something that I just kind of came across really quickly as I was just perusing through some Red Sox news, is that a former Red Sox prospect could potentially return back to Boston as he is on a team that is underperforming this year, and it's actually a need that the Red Sox find themselves in needing, right? They It's a need that they find themselves in needing, I think, right? Anyways, we're going to talk about that towards the end, and I'm also going to give a little outlook of what I could foresee for the 2021, or the rest of the 2021 season, right? The second half post-All-Star break. But I want to talk about the home run derby first, even though I think the first round draft pick, Marcelo Meyer, is a little bit more interesting of a topic. But since the all, uh, since the home run derby is literally in a couple of hours, I want to talk about that first, so I can give you just just rambling more of my thoughts about tonight's amazing event that we haven't had in almost two. Years. Actually, I guess technically it has been two years, right? So I went over the bracket last time on Friday's episode, but I will go through it again. Number uh, seed number one Shohei Otani versus number eight Juan Soto. Number two Joey Gallo versus number seven Trevor Story. Number three Matt Olson versus number six Trey Mancini. Number four Salvador Perez versus number five Pete Alonso. I really like this field of All Star caliber players. This field of stars in general. I think it's exactly what the game needs. The game needs Shohei Otani in it. The game needs Juan Soto. The state of Colorado and the city of Denver needs Trevor Story in this, right? Trey Mancini, a fantastic story, uh, beating stage three cancer, uh, colon cancer, not even finding out until that the cancer was already at stage three, I guess, in the process, in its form. I'm not exactly sure the terminology there. Number five, Pete Alonso, the defending champion from the 2019 Home Run Derby, which is the last time we had a Home Run Derby. And then Salvador Perez, a gritty veteran who's more known for his defense and his, uh, you know, his uh, pitch calling, right, with pitchers in Kansas City. That's kind of what he's known for. And he throws out runners. He commands a great game. But this year, he's having a fantastic year, hitting 20 home runs. And then you look at Matt Olson, someone that has a lot of pop in his bat, but is a tremendous fielder. So I'm going to be really interested to see how those two specifically perform. Because they're more known as defensive players and having 20 home runs come the All-Star break and being in the Home Run Derby, they got some pop this year. And it's going to be really interesting to see if one of those two players can kind of, you know, take the the bracket by storm, I would think, right? And then obviously Joey Gallo wrapping it up, who's probably one of the biggest trade names we have heard as we approach the trade deadline. A lot of teams are going to be in on him. Big, powerful lefty bat. He is very versatile playing the whole outfield. He can also play the corner infield first and third, but he's been at he's been in right field this year. He won gold glove, I believe, in center field last year. So this entire field has headlines, no matter who you pick. And then obviously, obviously, you have Shohei Tani, the two-way superstar. Juan Soto, who is one of the best up-and-coming players right now. He's got some swagger in the box when, you know, the pitcher throws a ball. He does that little shimmer in the box. It's 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 crazy. It's cuckoo. But those are your contestants. And I'm going to go through and predict. I'm going to kind of rapid fire this and give you a little reason why I think X is going to be Y. So let's just jump right into it, right? No need to lollygag and boot the tire. Number one, Shoyo Tani versus number eight, Juan Soto. I think this is going to be a really good first matchup between the one and the eight seed. Let me just adjust myself in my chair. I think Shohei Otani is going to win this. I don't think he's going to like walk away with it because Juan Soto, although he's only hit 10 home runs, I still think he has a lot of pop in his bat, but Juan Soto is a really good hitter in general and who likes to hit the big fly. Shohei Otani, 
as great as he is, he is a tremendous, tremendous threat this year, whether it's on the di- uh, on the batter's box or on the on the mound, right? So I do think Shohei Otani is going to win this. I don't think he's going to win it walking away. I think it's going to be close in terms of time, and I could totally see Shohei Otani kind of hitting that w- go-ahead or that winning home run with like less than like 30 or so seconds left. So it's definitely going to be a close one. But I have Shohei Otani winning the 1-8 and eight seed matchup. Uh, the second one would be Joey Gallo, number 2, versus number 7, Trevor Story. As much as I like Trevor Story, I just don't see him winning this one. As much as he's the Colorado Rockies homeboy, I don't see it happening. I don't. I think Joey Gallo has way too much pop in that bat. And Bogey better not start barking right now. Hey. Enough. He's in the other room and he's barking at the cat. Anyways, Joey Gallo has way too much pop in that bat. I've said this numerous times when talking about a potential trade for him that he's a home run or strikeout kind of hitter and when the ball is just going to be thrown right down the middle with that Colorado atmosphere balls are just going to be launched out he is a home run hitter Trevor Story is not he's a good hitter that can hit home runs I just don't see it happening I mean it sucks that Gallo is the two seed so he's going to have to uh, hit one more home run than whatever Trevor Story ends with but being home field advantage that might you know favor Trevor Story but you never know but I do have number two, Joey Gallo, beating Trevor Story. Third matchup is Matt Olson versus Trey Mancini. This is an interesting one. And it honestly, I honestly think it could go either way. I'm a big fan of lefty bats. I think they're more home run hitting kind of bats just because you're able to have the bat on the ball a little bit longer and just kind of push it towards right field. And in Colorado, you know, the thin air, the ball's going to carry a lot. I'd like to think that Matt Olson has a lot more pure power than Trey Mancini does, but I'm going to pick Trey Mancini in this case because I think the story of him beating stage three colon cancer is really going to like, you know, is going to kind of carry him. They're not going to stop. They're not going to stop talking about it. And it's such a good feel good story because, you know, he wasn't able to play any of 2020 even like before it got canceled with COVID, like in spring training, he couldn't play. And then obviously when the 60 game season came out, he wasn't able to play. So I think this is going to be a really good time for him to shine. And plus he just kind of mentioned that he has like a, he has a platform to kind of bring awareness to, to cancer, especially colon cancer, which he struggled with. So I really think that this is something that's going to be important to him. And I think he's going to really want to try to make a statement for just because he's a good player and that he wants to try to, you know, put his name like in the records book, but also try to bring more awareness to, you know, colon cancer and the like. So it's a toss up. I don't have a pure favorite in this one, but I'm going to go Trey Mancini, Trey Mancini because of the good feel good story. And then the last matchup in the first round is number four, Salvador Perez versus number five, Pete Alonzo. I, I said this on Friday that, Salvador Perez isn't really a home run hitter. He's a more of a defensive th- uh, defensive weapon, which I even said in the start of this episode. P. Alonso being the reigning home run champion, home run derby champion, I should say, from 2019. I think this is his ma- his round right here. I could honestly see, and I'm not going to spoil anything, but I could totally see him being the winner of the whole thing, or at least in the championship game. So I'm going to pick Pete Alonso. He's a power bat. He's a big home run threat. Salvador Perez really isn't. And I think the experience of being in the home run derby already with Pete Alonso will definitely favor him a lot in terms of other matchups outside of the Salvador Perez one because he's been in the home run derby before and none of these other guys have. So that's going to wrap it up for the first round. I have Shohei Otani beating Juan Soto. I have Joey Gallo beating Trevor Story. I have Trey Mancini beating Matt Olson, And then I have Pete Alonso beating Salvador Perez. The next matchup will be between Shohei Otani and Pete Alonso. This is going to be a tremendous, a tremendous round right here between the essential face of baseball, or at least the face of the 2021 season, Shohei Otani, the two-way star, and then the reigning champion, Pete Alonso, who's probably going to have a massive first round where Salvador Perez, I don't think is just going to be able to match. So we're going to be able to see Alonzo hit like 20 or so home runs. And I don't... 
I don't know. I really don't know about this one. I could see it go either way. And as much as I want to pick Otani, I'm going to go Pete Alonso. I just think that experience, that raw home run hitting power that Pete Alonso has, not that Otani doesn't, you know, having hitting the most home runs in the first half so far. I just think Pete Alonso is going to win this round right here. It's going to be close. And I think Otani's going to put a really good fight on, kind of like uh, Juan Soto, uh, like he did in the first round with Juan Soto. But I just think in those final seconds, he's not going to be able to do it. I think P. Alonso will take this one, but not easily. The second round matchup, or the second second round matchup, right, between Joey Gallo and Trey Mancini, I'm going to go Joey Gallo in this one. Big home run threat that he is. I just think he... As long as he hit, put the bat on the ball, it should be a home run in my opinion. So I'm going to pick Joey Gallo there. I don't think Trey Mancini has the pure power or enough of the power, I should say, to match Joey Gallo. And whatever Trey Mancini puts up, I think Joey Gallo will be able to easily, easily um, combat. So Gallo beating Trey Mancini, and then I also have Pete Alonso beating Shohei Otani. So for the championship round, we have Pete Alonso versus Joey Gallo. And I am, mm, this is tough. And I would honestly love to see this in the finals. <sighs> hmm. Um, I hate how my chair is squeaky. Like, see, you hear that? I don't know if you're going to hear that. I'll have to play it back to see if you can hear it. But, oh, it's so annoying. I'm going to, I love Joey Gallo a lot here. I really do. I'm going to go Joey Gallo because... Of that raw power, Pete Alonso has it as well. But I did say that, you know, home runs wise, lefties are favored, I believe, a little bit more than right handed hitters are. Gallo being a left handed and Alonso being a right handed hitter. So I'm going to go with Joey Gallo there. Would not be surprised if Pete Alonso defends his championship. If Pete Alonso didn't win in 2019, then I might lean Pete Alonso, but I just don't see him winning back to back home run derbies. But I could totally be wrong. But for now, I'm going to go Joey Gallo just for a little diversity. And because I've been so high on Joey Gallo, plus I'd love to see the Red Sox trade for Joey Gallo. But that's a story for another episode. So that is my official home run derby bracket breakdown analysis and predictions. I really can't wait for the home run derby tonight, which I'm very, very excited for. Like I've mentioned, it is my favorite all-star event in all of sports. Uh, better than the slam dunk comp, better than the three-point competition, better than the skills challenge, better than the NFL skills challenge, whatever the hell they do. I know they'd be playing dodgeball now. And I mean, I don't really follow too much hockey. Uh, I guess they have a skills challenge, I believe. But nonetheless, I'm so excited for the home run derby and I hope you are too. Comment down below whether if you're watching on YouTube or reach out to me on social media at Merce underscore Boston ST and let me know who you think is going to be winning the 2021 home run derby is it Shohei Otani is it Pete Alonso is it Joey Gallo is it the hometown Trevor story you heard my thoughts I want to hear yours so let's keep it keeping with baseball let's transition over to the draft which is maybe the biggest news of the past couple days in terms of uh, Boston sports is that the Red Sox were able to draft Marcelo Meyer shortstop coming out of East Lake High School in California Now, the reason why I want to note this and the reason why I want to talk about this briefly, won't go too far into it because I know a lot of people don't really care about the baseball draft. And okay, I I respect that. I mean, I don't really care for it either. But this class is super, super duper interesting. So Marcelo Meyer, I don't want to say was the consensus, number one overall pick. But I would probably say seven, like 70 to 80% of mock drafts had him going number one. He has so much talent. He has a huge high ceiling. He can hit. He can hit for contact. He can hit for power. He can play defense. He can throw. And he can run. He is a five-tool infielder. And the Pittsburgh Pirates with the number one overall pick passed on him. And they took a catcher out of Louisville, Henry Davis, who is probably the most surefire bet pick. Because he is the most proven and most MLB ready. He just hit 370 this past year with 15 home runs. So, (laughs) it's such a much safer pick is Henry Davis. 
He is more MLB ready now, and he's definitely a player that can, a franchise can be built around. And I'd probably say you could say that about a lot of the other players in this draft too. And I was a little surprised that the Pirates took Henry Davis. But I was like, all right, okay. And then the Rangers, a little upset here. The Rangers took Jack Leiter, who was my my uh, favorite prospect in the draft. And I really wanted the uh, Red Sox to get him. And I saw that the Red Sox, you know, in my mind, looking at the board, I could see them getting him. Although he was ranked number one on the preseason list, top pitching prospect. But there was just a few shortstops, you know, Meyer being one of them, then Jordan Lawler. And if you're into the draft, you know who I'm talking about. If not, then I'm I, sorry that I'm speaking foreign to you. But Jack Leiter, you know, I could have saw a fall to the Red Sox because of the, you know, the Henry Davis. And then, you know, the couple shortstops that I mentioned just being valued more because unlike the NFL draft or the basketball draft, you, in baseball, you just kind of take the best available player. Because your team's not going to see these guys for at least like two to five years. So it's not like you're drafting someone for a need that you have now. You're drafting someone because they have the best talent, they have the best, uh, the highest ceiling, and you want to build your team around that in the future. But the Rangers took Jack Leiter, being the best pitcher available. I don't blame them. So Tigers also took a uh, pitcher as well. They did not take uh, Kumar Rocker, who I kind of thought was going to be a little higher, maybe top five, but he did fall to the Mets at 10. Not going to talk too much about that. And then that leaves the Red Sox at number four, where they took Marcelo Meyer. Like I said, 70 to 80% of the mock drafts had him going number one, but the Red Sox were able to get him at number four. And I'm super duper excited for the Red Sox being able to get such a player like this. Obviously, he's 18. We probably won't see him until he's like 21, 22 or so. I mean, Wanda Franco, the Rays just called up and he was, and he's 20. So, I mean, if things pan out, we could see Meyer in two years. I don't know. I mean, Xander Bogarts has an opt-out at the end of next year, so we could see him opt-out and maybe not come back. I mean, that's kind of, you know, Red Sox' worst nightmare. So, but, hey, at least we have a security blanket and an option right there as well. So, I'm not going to go too much into the draft or Marcelo Meyer because I know, like I said, a lot of people don't really care about the draft or – just not interested, especially because it's the baseball draft. And, you know, obviously if this was football, we could dive a lot more into it. So that is the big news coming out of the draft for the Red Sox. Obviously the other, I think it's like 20 rounds or whatever it is. I don't know how many. It used to be like 60, then they cut it down. So I'm going to end that conversation there. Definitely let me know what you think about the draft if you're into it i'm not going to ask anybody or everybody to but if you're into the draft you know let me know what you thought of whether it was the red sox picking you know jack Leiter going to texas the pirates not taking meyer definitely let me know on social media or down in the comment section below if you're listening on youtube so i do the meat of this episode is going to be me breaking down the red sox first half right i really do believe that the red sox are exceeding expectations by far right no one expected them to be in first place with a 55 and 36 record, which is, let's see, let's base it off a winning percentage. It is the tied for third best tied. No tied for second best in the American league. Right. I just, I think they're over overachieving. I think they're highly, highly exceeding expectations, not just individual players, but just as a team. Uh, currently they have a 90.3% chance to make the playoffs and a 6.4% chance to win the World Series. As it stands right now, I like those odds, but I definitely want to see those odds get increased and go up a little bit higher. Currently, the team with the best odds to win the World Series, believe it or not, is the Los Angeles Dodgers at 20.4%, San Francisco Giants at 14.4%, the Tampa Bay Rays at 10.4%, Oh, I skipped the Astros. I'm sorry. 14.4% for the Astros. Chicago White Sox at 8.8%. And then the Red Sox at 6.4%. I mean, you're kind of... I guess you talk about those, you know, top... I don't want to say upper echelon teams, but those, you know, top five, top six teams. You're kind of in the bottom right there. And I would deservingly say so. I, you know, the Red Sox are on a 100 win pace. I just don't think that this roster is built to last 162 games. 
they're currently a game and a half up on the Tampa Bay Rays. You know, they finished the last 10 games, 5-5. Five and five. The Rays are 6-4. and four. This team still needs more to it. I've mentioned this countless times before. They need another left-handed bat, and I strongly believe they could use another arm. I don't, I cannot express this enough. I do not want Chris Sale returning, being like, oh, Chris Sale is our acquisition at the deadline when he comes back mid-August. When they bring up Tanner Houck, I don't want him to be like, oh, this young gun was our, you know, acquisition. Like, no, don't give me that. Don't give me that. Your leading hitter in terms of average is 321 in Alexander Bogarts, followed by 299 JD Martinez, and then a 282 Rafael Devers. To me, that's not good enough. And I've mentioned Adam Frazier plenty of times, where he's a second baseman outfielder, gives you versatility, gives you good defense and some speed. But on top of that, he's a good hitter. He can hit for average, and that's exactly what the Red Sox need in this particular situation. Vasquez, 261, Dahlback, 219. Uh, Christian Arroyo, 264. Verdugo, 278. Uh, Kike, 236. Two, uh, 237, excuse me. Hunter Renfro, 263. Marwin Gonzalez, 205. Danny Santana, 167. Kevin Plawecki, uh, Kevin Plawecki, 250. And Michael Chavis, 203. You need more. You need more. I've talked about Adam Frazier before. And I've talked about Joey Gallo being a big trade deadline piece for a potential playoff team. I would love the Red Sox to pursue him. I really would. Would that kind of take away from the potential of Jaron Duran coming up? Maybe. Maybe. But, like, why can't you have them both? Why can't you have them both, you know? You know, you can use Joey Gallo as a, you know, as a center fielder, you know, move Kike to the bench because I'm so, I, he's had a great two weeks, but it's been two weeks. And do you really want your leadoff hitter be hit to be hitting 237? Not that Joey Gallo would be, but I'm just saying Joey Gallo would be essentially a replacement for Kike. Adam Frazier would be a replacement for Kike. One thing that I really want the Red Sox to address is hitting. Is the number one thing. Bring in a left-handed bat. This team needs that. Uh, one thing that is kind of weird is that J.D. Martinez has grounded into 12 double plays. I know it's a weird stat, but I'm just looking at you know baseball reference with you know all the the statistics thus far, and you know Alex Verdugo has eight, Devers has six, Vasquez has six, but 12 from J.D. Martinez. That is quite interesting. That really is. Home run wise, uh, I think I had Bogarts around. I think the over under on him was like 22, 25. I forget what it was preseason when I when I broke over unders down for the Red Sox uh, preseason. But he's definitely on pace to be like you know upper upper twenties, low thirties. And I think I had him pegged. I was like, oh, I don't see him hitting just thirty, but I can see him being you know close to it. I think I had him at twenty eight. So. I could see Bogart still, you know, hitting 28 or so home runs. Devers already at 22. I could easily, easily see him flirt with 40. I don't think he'll get there. I could see 35 being the number. J.D. Martinez at 18. 30 is obviously still an option for him. When he gets hot, he's going to get hotter as the sun. So I wouldn't be surprised if he goes on like a complete three-week tear, hitting like, you know, 12 home runs and just batting like 400 for three weeks. So expect him to get hot, get hot soon. But as it stands, 18 right now, I would definitely hit the over on 30. Who else do I want? Who else is worth talking about, really? I mean, okay, so Bobby Dahlback is an interesting one. He has 10 home runs, 36 RBIs, but he's hitting 219. Now, I guess this kind of segues into a topic I'm going to talk about a little bit later, and I don't want to spoil it now, but... The Red Sox are in an interesting situation with Bobby Dahlbeck. He's 26 years old. He's played 72 games so far. And his developing, his hitting has really progressed slowly. I think his defense for a first uh, first year first baseman is very well. I, I would strongly believe so. Let's see. Does he have, can I get ever right, team fielding? Here we go. Team fielding. Uh, Bobby Dahlbeck, errors, errors, errors. He has six errors, okay? You know what? When you look at Raphael Devers with 13 on the other side, I, I'm not going to complain about six errors. For my first year, 
first baseman, not just being a rookie, but it's his first year at first base. Obviously, he spent some time down in AAA, but that's besides the point. I think he's doing great defensively, at least. You know, as a whole, as a team, I would definitely would like to see the fielding become better, hence why I think Adam Frazier would be a great addition, hence why I think Joey Gallo would be a great addition. But another player I'm going to talk about in just a little bit would even help with that defense over at first base and just defense in general. But I, I need to see Bobby Dahlbeck do better hitting-wise. I mean, 10 home runs, I'm not going to complain about that. 36 RBIs, you know, coming from the, you know, 8 or 9 hole most nights. I'll take that. But the 219 hitting, that's 264 on base percentage. Not liking that at all. I definitely don't, oh, obviously, well, at the beginning of the year, I had him pegged to win AL Rookie of the Year. And I just don't think that's an option at this point. Could he go on a second half tear and throw his name in the ring? Maybe, but I highly, highly doubt that. Especially with the deadline coming soon, I can. I honestly think the Red Sox will probably try to find a platoon first baseman to kind of go hand in hand with Bobby Dahlback a little bit. Overall, though, this team hitting wise, at least I'll, I'll talk about the pitching in just a little bit. But hitting wise, I cannot complain at all i really do like how they are performing thus far and they've exceeded expectations and i do think that the red sox need to address their team at the trade deadline because otherwise you have like the seventh best chance to win the world series or whatever it was behind a few national league teams behind the rays and the white Sox. but this team deserves to be given a chance i've said this on friday and i said this during the trade deadline season for the celtics and the bruins make a move to show us you're serious. Because if you don't make a move, then you're just content sitting on your hands and you're still planning for the future. And planning for the future is not bad. But when you have a team that's in first place right now, you have Xander Bogarts in his prime, Rafael Devers just starting his prime, J.D. Martinez, who is probably on the tail end of his prime, Alex Verdugo, who you got for Mookie Betts, pretty much you know at the beginning of his prime as well. These guys deserve help they do otherwise this team should be a middle of the pack team a 500 team or just above that like we all expected them to be improve this team because when i see this you know this roster a bunch of 230s 260 hitters yeah it might be better than most teams in baseball and i don't know where their their team ranking for batting average sits but i know it's at least i think last time i checked it was like number one or number two but that just because the number one or number two, whatever it was, a couple weeks ago, doesn't mean you are today and doesn't mean you can't improve on what you're already good at. The rich can get richer. So I really want to see the Red Sox go get a move for a left-handed bat to help out their lineup as I do believe that they need it. Pitching-wise, I can't say... I mean, okay, so looking at the pitching rotation, Nathan Ivaldi, 9-5. and five. His over-under was 9 wins. He's already hit that. 366 ERA. Cannot complain about him. He is definitely performing like an ace. Nick Pavetta, 7-4 with a 4.30 ERA. Can't complain about him. Would like to see the ERA just a little bit lower. It's a little bit lower. But I think 7-4 for him, especially when you trade away Brandon Workman and Heath Hembry, and then especially getting Brandon Workman back after the Phillies released him and then the Cubs released him. Absolute win right there. Garrett Richards, not even going to talk about him. 5-5 with a 4.91 ERA. He can probably go. Eduardo Rodriguez, severely disappointing. 6-5 and five with a 5-5-2 ERA. On pace for 9 wins. And his over-under, I believe, was 9. And I, like I said, I said that because if the Red Sox want to be competitive, they're going to need him, Andy Valdi, to get to 9 wins. And then Martin Perez, 7-5 and five with a 4-0-4 ERA. Been a very good surprise. I feel like you don't really hear about Perez's good starts. You only hear about his bad starts. But, I mean, 7-5 and five with a 4.04 ERA, you're going to take that. You're absolutely going to take that from him. And I think this rotation as a whole has been surprisingly good, unexpectedly good. Could that because, be because of spider tack and sticky substances? Maybe. I don't know. And, obviously, that's why I kind of like you know what baseball did, just kind of shut it down midseason so we can have those first half, second half. Not first half, second half, but like, oh, during foreign substance usage and after substance usage. So I'm definitely interested to look at the statistics after the season in that case. 
But overall, I really like this pitching when Tanner Houck comes up, when uh, when Chris Sale comes back, pitching will improve. That's kind of why I put the pitching on the back seat for Red Sox needs, especially because their bullpen has been very well, very well. Matt Barnes, two six one ERA, who just got resigned for another two years. Adam Ottavino, two six eight ERA. Um, Salamora, two four five. Josh Taylor, three eight six. You know, uh, Darwin's and Hernandez. 2.7 ERA, Garrett Whitlock, 1.44 ERA, and then Brandon Workman with a 3.21 ERA. You're going to take those numbers. You're going to take those numbers. That's why I don't think pitching is as much of a need, and I'm not saying that Chris Sale coming back is going to be your Lord and Savior. I'm not saying Tanner Houck coming up is going to be your Lord and Savior, but they're going to be nice in-club additions to a pitching staff that doesn't need a major addition couple weeks ago, I would say that they needed some major additions. But when you have Chris Sale and Tanner Huck coming up on a pitching staff that's already very, very good, I'm going to put a pitching need backseat when you have a blaring need in the lineup, which is contact hitting and left-handed bats. So I really like how the pitching staff has performed thus far, so far this year. I'm really excited to see what the pitching staff is able to do moving forward as the second half. Um, gets underway and as you know July and August come and go into September I think this pitching staff this bullpen bullpen specifically will be able to hold the pitching rotation is another story I'm not exactly sure I could totally see them going to a six-man rotation once you know sale comes back if he is a starter or at least when Tanner Hawk gets the call up I could totally see them going to a six-man rotation as the weather you know heats up more consistently right I mean we had like a week of 95 to 100 degree weather and then it's been rain and cold and humidity but once you know this you know whole rain garbage is done with you know second half getting to the dog days of august i can see a six-man rotation once you know sale gets healthy and huck comes up that's why you know the pitching is not a need for me anymore i mean who are you gonna get like i mean i guess you can always find somebody but why pay a premium for a relief pitcher when you already have a really good pitching staff when you're going to be calling um, bringing back two pitchers already. I would just rather the Red Sox invest their, their time and energy in improving this lineup. Move on from Marwin Gonzalez. Move on from, I don't want to say move on, but you know, bolster your first base need with uh, Bobby Dahlback and somebody else. What are you going to do with Michael Chavis? What are you going to do with uh, Franchi Cordero, who's you know like, apparently tearing it up in AAA? Jaron Duran even, what are you going to do with him? Kike Hernandez, is 237 really a leadoff hitter to be boasting about? I don't know. Can you go out and get a stable second baseman? Because is Christian Arroyo that guy? Hitting 264 with five home runs and 22 RBIs? Wouldn't you like to improve that? You know, during the 2018 run, the Red Sox brought in Ian Kinsler. Wasn't the flashiest name or the biggest of names, but someone that was going to bring you good defense, you know, 100% effort, and who could, you know, hit for contact. So I definitely want to see the Red Sox address their hitting and their lineup needs this trade deadline season. And with that being said, I've alluded to it enough. I'm going to finally talk about it. The player that I just found out about that the Red Sox could be bringing back is former prospect. Who never played a, who never played a, a pitch for the Red Sox, but they were in he was in their system. Is Anthony Rizzo, the form well I don't want to say former, but the current Cubs first baseman, former All Star. Yes, Anthony Rizzo. He's on the last year of a I don't know how many year deal, uh, but he signed a seventy five million dollar extension a few years ago. I don't even know how many years it was four or five or whatever maybe. And I would love for the Red Sox to bring Anthony Rizzo, I guess, back home, I guess. I don't really know if you would call it home. I mean, he never really played for us, but he was a prospect in our system. I would love to see the Red Sox pull this off. The Cubs are 94% chance of going to be going into rebuild mode. Anthony Rizzo is due up the end of this year. Javier Baez is due up at the end of this year. Chris Bryant is due up at the end of this year. Baez could be leaving. Chris Bryant's been rumored to be traded. Might as well trade Anthony Rizzo as well. And I think the Red Sox needing a first baseman, a left-handed hitter, 
it fits perfectly. Anthony Rizzo, a great glove. He can hit the ball fairly well. I mean, he's hitting 247 this year. But overall, the Cubs are having a down year, and he probably wouldn't be your starter day in and day out. He could be serving as a platoon role to Bobby Dahlbeck. I just, I think it'd be a low cost because, like I said, Anthony Rizzo's in the final year of his deal. So you're getting a rental player who's 31 years old, and you're going to get 100% out of Anthony Rizzo because he's going to be wanting to you know, fight and play and perform for that next contract after this year. I just think it's a potential win-win for the Red Sox. It really is because Bobby Dahlbeck has been underperforming. You bring in someone like Anthony Rizzo, who is well-known around the league and well-respected around the league for not only his defensive prowess, but you know his above-average offensive game. You know, his career is 239 home runs. He's a career 269 hitter. Call it 270. He has 786 RBIs. And his slugging, uh, his on-base plus slugging is 852. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. And if for all you analytical nerds out there that care about war, he has a career 36.4 war. I don't know, is that percent? Average, what is that, like, you know, dollar sign? <laughs> But yes, so I would love to see Anthony Rizzo come here. Ideally, all right, in a perfect world, in a perfect world. Actually, I don't know if it's a perfect world, but in a world, I would like the Red Sox to trade for Adam Frazier in one of Joey Gallo or Anthony Rizzo. If they, if, you know, if they only get one of those two guys and Adam Frazier, yippee, I'm on board. I think they're more likely to trade for Anthony Rizzo because it will be cheaper than Joey Gallo because Joey Gallo has a year and a half left on his contract, or I guess of his team control because of the stupid arbitration. So Anthony Rizzo, low cost, rental. Adam Frazier would be a little bit more expensive because he has team control. But those two players would be significant impacts for this team and really vault you to serious World Series contention. Those are just my opinions, folks. I want to hear yours. Reach out to me, you know, through social media at Murphs underscore Boston ST, where the ST stands for sports talk. Or if you're watching on YouTube, please comment down below your thoughts, opinions about anything, everything that we talked about in today's episode. A rather shorter episode today because, you know, the home run derby is just a mere hour or two away. So I kind of want to bang this episode out, get it out to you ASAP beforehand. And in addition, Besides Red Sox, there's not a lot going on. So I figured instead of wasting your time, I would just kind of get you in, get you out in in a decent uh, amount of time. So thank you so much for downloading, listening, and enjoying. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode as I did. I can't wait to record Friday's episode as we'll talk about the Home Run Derby, the All-Star Game, and then obviously Red Sox second half as well. But between now and then, between now and then, you know that I love you. And you know that I will... Wait a second. Wait a second. If you're watching on YouTube, please like the video if you enjoyed it. If you're new to the channel or haven't considered it yet, please hit that big giant red subscribe button. And like I already asked you, please comment down below. And if you're not watching on YouTube and you're listening on audio-only platforms, reach out to me on social media. At Murph's underscore Boston Sports Talk, like I said. Any, anything else? I think that might be it. Between now and the next episode, enjoy your week. Enjoy your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I will see you on Friday for Friday's episode of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. You know that I love you, and you know that I will always see you. (laughs) 